Awesome. Very nice. I invite you to please rise and join us in our call to worship. It's on the screen, also printed in your bulletin. God is calling you today. God needs your gifts and graces to help others. Come, let us worship and celebrate God's love for us. Let us show our faithfulness in our words and actions. Amen. Please remain standing and join us in our opening hymn, which is The Solid Rock, hymn number 404. Words will be on the screen. Amen. Please be seated. Wonderful. So last week, if you were here last week, what did I talk about last week? Anybody remember? I'll give you a hint. It had something to do with that. Stone in the pot. Stone in the pot. Yeah, we did stone soup last week. And stone soup is a story about a guy that went into a town and no one thought they had enough for anything and he pulled out a stone and a pot and put water in it, threw the stone in there, um, and everybody started to bring stuff to add to the pot because he said he had stone soup. Nah, it's okay. Well, just going to summarize a little bit in case people weren't here. So if people weren't here last week, they know what I'm talking about. Sound good? So people ran and they got a cabbage, and then they went and they got carrots, and they got onions, and they put them all in the pot. Because he kept saying, this stone soup is so good, but it would be even better with little bits of beef. So they went and got beef and put it in the pot. And before you know it, these people that didn't think they had enough for anything had enough soup to feed the entire village, which was kind of cool. And it all started with his stone. And that's such a great story, and it's a cool thing, and it reminds us that when we all pitch in and help out with one another, we can do really good things. But then I realized that there's more to this story for us as Christians, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to give each of you a rock today, and it's going to have a cross on it. Because unlike just taking a stone around and adding it to a pot, the one thing that we have to offer that will always change every community and every person's life, including ours, is Jesus. I can get marker off. You can get marker off? <laughs> Are you going to take the cross off your rock? <laughs> so anyway, I want to give you a rock with a cross on it as a reminder that you as a Christian 
have the opportunity to make a difference in your life and other people's lives by sharing who Jesus was and how amazing Jesus is. Because Jesus, he loves us a lot, doesn't he? Yeah. He's a pretty cool guy, I think. Yeah. So who wants a rock? All right. Come on over. Who would like this one? There you go. All right. I got a whole bag of them. What? All right, here you go. Come take a look. See what I got in the bag. And you can reach in and pick out your rock. What did I do? I didn't do it. I didn't. Honest, I didn't. You know who did? I made Joel do it. <laughs> Oh, maybe no, that would even be better. But all right, can we pray over our rocks? Excellent. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for being our God. Thank you for Jesus Christ, who's our friend and our Savior. Lord, help us to use these rocks to remember God's great love for us and help us to use the rocks as a reminder to share God's love with others too. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I have a quick request. Before you go down to Children's Church, can you drop your rock off with your, your, your parents and leave it with them and then go downstairs because Miss Deb might be worried about what will happen with rocks when you go downstairs. I don't know. So anyway, sound good? Excellent. Thanks, guys. So this is a time in our service where we have the opportunity to share our joys and our concerns with one another. Um, and got a couple people who will be grabbing microphones real quick. Uh, we'll get those around, but I have a few that I wanted to lift up while we get those together. Uh, one, please keep Steve Ryder in your prayers. He had an emergency uh, appendectomy uh, and is, as far as I know, still in the hospital, so please uh, pray for him. Also, Pauline. Um, has a blood clot, uh, and they are treating her for that and keeping her in the hospital to try and take care of that. So um, Steve and Kim obviously are, well, Kim's here. I could have let you say it. <laughs> I saw Steve wasn't here, but, you know, just please pray for, uh, for Pauline and for Steve and the whole family as they're worried about her. Uh, I also wanted to extend a thank you uh, to Springvale for hosting the um, Charge Conference on Tuesday this past week. You did a wonderful job. It was, uh, the food was great. The fellowship was great. So thank you. And everything looked really beautiful. So thanks for taking part in that. Um, Jer, let's turn to God in prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we gather this morning to be in your presence to be in the presence of a God who loves us, a God who hears us, who hears the prayers that we lift up, but also hears the prayers that remain on our hearts. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you for being with us and being with family members and loved ones that are battling illness or medical concerns or uh, other things that are just weighing them down. You are a God that could carry us through anything. You are a God that can give us strength when all we can see is weakness. You are a God that can heal us when all we can see is pain and suffering. Lord, we thank you for that. And thank you for the reminder that you are a God that will see us through all things. Lord, we also lift up to you um, the joys of, of healing and birthdays and anniversaries and gathering with family and, and the, our confirmation class and our... Um, our fall festival and uh, the fellowship that we had on Tuesday and everything else. Thanks for being present in all of this, Lord. Thanks for the blessing of your calling on us, of your will for us to be your church. Lord, we love you, and we lift up to you the prayer that your Son taught us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we'll enter into a time of passing our plates for tithes and offerings. I invite the ushers to please come forward. Heavenly Father, we offer up to you the gifts that have been collected in our plates, also the tithes and the offerings that have come in online, but also the hands and the feet of your people in this church that have served you with their gifts, their graces, their time, and their talents. We ask your blessing upon all of these gifts and ask that you multiply them so that we may use them to be the church you are calling us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
church. So today's scripture reading is from James 2, verses 14 through 24. Faith and deeds. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that it, there is one God, good, even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you have evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, and not by faith alone. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you and give you thanks again for your word. We give you thanks for its clear teaching, for its love and its guidance. We thank you, God, for the help that you give us in living it out. We pray that as we try to express our faith in our deeds, in our actions, in our words, we pray that you strengthen us, guide us, and use us for your glory. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you haven't learned this about me yet, James is probably one of my favorite books in the Bible. I love how clear he is. I love how like just straight out he is. He doesn't pull any punches. He doesn't make it flowery. He doesn't make it difficult to understand. He just puts it straight out there. Whether you like it or not, or whether you agree with him or not, he's just right out there up front sharing what he's thinking and how to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Our passage today is probably one of the more infamous passages from James in which he asserts that faith without works is dead. This has led to a ton of theological controversy over the years, thinking that James is talking about works righteousness. Works righteousness is the idea that you can earn your way into salvation by the things that you do. In Greek, the term would be meganoito. Absolutely not. That is not correct. Our salvation comes from faith alone, faith in Jesus Christ. But I would argue that what James is really trying to explain is that faith bears fruit. Correct? Would you agree with me on that? Follow my logic. If you have faith, then you have the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, then you have gifts. If you have gifts, then you have a calling. If you follow your calling because of your faith, then it only follows that you will bear fruit. If you choose to do nothing with your faith, then the question comes down to, do you really have faith? And I think that logic stream is all in what James is trying to get at with this entire question. It's not a question of, are you doing things enough to have salvation? It's, do you have faith? And is there evidence of that faith? Is there fruit of the faith that you have? And is it able to be seen? Because if you have faith, it should be visible. And to illustrate that a little bit, he brings up this incredible story from the Old Testament about Abraham and Isaac. And for any parents in the room, this is one of those stories that is really hard um, to, to grapple with. We hear it and we're like, yeah, good way to go, Abraham. Good to go, bud. But what if we were asked that question? So just to give a recap, Abraham was going to be the one to basically start all the people of God. The, his descendants were going to be as many as the stars in the heaven, as many as the grains of sand 
Um, but the son that he and Sarah were given as a gift from God was Isaac. This was going to be the first one. This was the evidence of God's blessing for them and the evidence of what God was going to do with them. But if we really think about it, Abraham was going to need to have incredible faith in God to be able to see all of this through. So God asked Abraham to take his son Isaac to take his son Isaac up on a mountain, set up an altar, and sacrifice him. Not, you know, in show or anything like that, to literally take the wood, take the fire, take the knife, and sacrifice his son. As a dad, I don't know. I just don't know. With how much you love your kids, can you imagine even contemplating offering your child up to God. Now, if you're a parent of a teenager, be careful how you answer. Just saying, because I know there are days. However, in general, if you really had your heart of hearts to think about it, you know, how hard would that be to do? The main point of this story has nothing to do with what Abraham actually did but everything to do with the faith and trust in God that it took for him to follow through with what he was asked. Because he did it. No, he didn't sacrifice Isaac, but not because of his choosing, but because of God's choosing. God provided another way. God needed to see that Abraham had enough faith in him that he could put, that Abraham could put his trust in God's will and know that God was doing something. That if God had blessed him in his old age and Sarah's old age to be able to have a child, then God must have had something in, in mind, a, a plan in place that he didn't understand, but he had enough faith in God that he was going to follow through and see where this went. And when God saw that he had that faith, he provided another way. But it was important for Abraham to know that he truly trusted God. It was important for God to know that Abraham truly had that kind of faith. Do we have faith? Do we have that kind of faith? Or does our faith stop where our trust ends? Hear me again. Do we have faith or does our faith stop where our trust ends? ends it's a very challenging question but tough questions are good i don't know about you but i need those tough questions they help to keep me in line they help to remind me of who i am who i'm called to be and what i'm meant to do tough questions hold me accountable to god's call and god's will in my life and i believe they do for each of us because they're important for each of us to take the time to grapple with those tough questions so that we could be who God is calling us to be and do what God is calling us to do. A modern day James for me is a friend of mine by the name of Reverend Dr. Kenda Creasy Dean. And we met several years ago after she had written this book. It's called The God Bearing Life The Art of Soul Tending for Youth Ministry. She was a pastor in the Baltimore Washington Conference, but she was on loan to Princeton Seminary where she was helping to lead youth ministry classes uh, through that seminary. But she did a lot with youth ministry around, and we met through those circles. She, in fact, she was one of the people that saw God's call in me uh, toward pastoral ministry and encouraged me to pursue it uh, all the more. Uh, her encouragement and her affirmation of seeing what God was doing in through my life is why I'm in front of you today, because I never saw it myself. I kept hearing it from other people, but hadn't seen it in myself, and she helped me to be able to see it. But she is one of these people that asks those tough questions. And as she says, she asks them of herself first, and then she asks them of other people because she feels like God is saying, ask the question, so I was at a youth ministry conference with her, and it was a room of close to a thousand uh, youth 
youth leaders and youth ministers in that room, and she asked us all the question of whether our ministry was worth the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross. Hear me again. She asked us all the question of whether our ministry was worth the sacrifice that Christ had made on the cross. Every single one of us in that room felt like we had just been punched in the gut. You could hear gasps, but you couldn't hear anything else. The room just went silent with that question. But it was such a valid and important question. Every single one of us needed to hear that question and be reminded of what our ministry is all about. In youth ministry, so much can get focused on the programming and the, the fluff and the, the, you know, the wrapping on the gift instead of what the actual gift is, we can sometimes forget that the main gift is Jesus Christ. But it's not just youth ministry, it's ministry as a whole. How many times can we in the church get so caught up in the wrappings or the carpet color or you know things like that that don't matter as much that we forget that our main and primary calling is toward the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he did for us for our salvation on that cross. I ask myself that question that she asked of all of us that day many times because it is a strong accountability question. It is one that reminds you of who you are supposed to be and causes you to reflect on where you are. It is because of this question that I take my ministry very seriously. It is because of this question that I am so intentional about many of the things that I do in ministry. And it is why I am so humbled to serve in ministry, and I do not take lightly the fact that God called me to care for his sheep. Doing so with humility and integrity is at the core of who I am as a person, as a parent, as a husband, and as a pastor. All of this stems from that one question which is so similar to the one that James asks us all to consider. Do we have faith and do we live it out? Does our faith bear the evidence of fruit? This is similar to the question I am sure some of you have heard. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? You heard that before? I think some of you have even posted it on Facebook. <laughs> I've seen it around there before. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? What we do as Christians matters. It is the evidence of our faith. People will either see that we have faith in the things that we say, the way we act, and what we do, or they will not. There's a famous, I don't know if it's legend or if it's real, I've always understood it to be real, but, um, and I'll butcher the quote if I try and say it precisely, but Gandhi was asked at one point that he actually considered Christianity but then he didn't see it being lived out in the Christians that he knew, so he lost the idea that this was a valid faith to give his life over to. Since he didn't see Christians acting like Christ, he shied away from it. Who we are, what we do, how we act matters. In many cases, it's the gospel, the only gospel that people are going to see. In Kenda's book, she offered up the following words of wisdom that I quote often in youth ministry circles, but I think it is something that all Christians could benefit from hearing, because like James, it's real, and it's out front, and there's no sugarcoating in it. She says this, adolescents are looking for a soul-shaking, heart-waking, world-changing God to fall in love with. And if they do not find that God in the Christian church, they will most certainly settle for lesser gods elsewhere. And if we're honest, so will we. Youth look to the church to show them something, someone capable of turning their lives inside out and the world upside down. 
most of the time we have offered them pizza. If you've ever done anything in youth ministry, pizza is like the primary food group. <laughs> if you're having a youth event, order pizza. Friday night, we ordered pizza. Um, but, you know, it's remembering that there's more to the ministry than just the pizza. There's more to the ministry than making sure we have coffee or snacks or things like that. There's more to the ministry than just the surface level stuff. It really comes down to what are we offering? Jesus Christ. When we live by faith, when we trust in that faith and act on our faith, we have so much more to offer the world than just pizza. We have a Savior who saved us that we can offer as salvation for the world around us. This happens when we live a life worthy of the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross for each of us. Are we living a life worthy of that sacrifice? This happens when people not only know we have faith, but can see it in and through us. It's not enough just to say, yeah, I'm a Christian and I go to that church. Do they see it lived out in who we are? Christ is what we have to offer the world. So let's make sure we remember to share that. Rather than things that don't really, truly, or eternally matter. This needs to happen and be evident in every part of our church ministries. Every church ministry, whether it's with the children or the adults, whether it's in a fall fest or whatever else we're doing, how are we offering Christ? How are we sharing evidence of that salvation working in and through us, the Holy Spirit being present in each and every one of us? How is that being shown in every ministry we do in the church? Not only that, how is it evident in our ministry with our family? Our role as a Christian doesn't end when we walk out that door. It goes with us to lunch. It goes with us to the store. It goes with us to the ball field. It goes with us wherever we go. It goes with us to the dinner table in our house. How is it evident that we as a father or a mother, a son or a daughter, are showing evidence that Christ is alive in us? because of the faith that we have in him that his Holy Spirit is living out of each and every one of us? How is it evident in our relationships with our neighbors, our friends, and our co-workers? It even needs to be evident in the little things we do, like giving out candy tonight for Halloween. That's why I picked this picture. I'm sorry, Trina is not here, and I should have asked her if it was okay to use it, but it was on our Facebook page, so I just borrowed it. This was Trina Yuri's trunk for our trunk or treat this year. And yes, we were giving out candy to kids, but look at the message that was being offered. Let Jesus light your way. It was not just the candy. It was the message. It was the sharing of a loving Savior, an incredible God, a salvation that could be offered to everyone. They weren't just getting candy. They were getting Jesus. Just like the trunk you see on the screen that Trina and her family shared this year for Trunk or Treat, feed tonight any kid that comes more than just candy. Find a fun, creative, and faithful way to share Jesus too. Let's let the evidence of Christ shine through us and show that we truly do have faith. Faith in Christ alone. Let's allow the tough questions to resonate and sink in and guide us. They help to form us into who we are. It's God's way of chiseling through those rough edges so that we become the disciple that we're meant to be. We can all do that. We're all called to do that. We have faith. Now let's bear fruit. Amen? Amen. I invite you to please rise and join us in our hymn of sending, Freely, Freely.
freely, freely, you have, belie- you have believed, freely, freely give. Isn't that what we're being asked? You have faith in God, share that faith, show that faith, bear fruit in that faith. Sometimes it starts with asking ourselves tough questions, reminding ourselves of who we are supposed to be, who we are meant to be, not letting us get caught up in superficial things that don't really matter all that much. People need to hear the gospel. They need to know that Jesus is alive and have that opportunity, just like we've had, to live into a faith that will save us. The world needs it, and we have it to offer. Freely, freely give. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Go in peace. Amen.